for a thousand years, kings and queens of Europe had absolute power. But absolute power corrupts absolutely. Greed, revenge, sex, madness, witchcraft, murder. Every monarch had their royal secrets. Every year on the 5th of November, the British celebrate a plot to kill a king. An assassin named Guy Fawkes planned to blow up Parliament and the king, but he was caught as he lit the fuse. Guy Fawkes was one of many assassins who have plagued royalty. Kings were constantly on their guard because anyone, foe, friend or even family, could be plotting to take the crown. Most murder attempts failed, but the debauched Edward II of England, French peacemaker Henry IV, saintly King Wenceslas, all had a date with assassins. In the Czech capital of Prague, a chapel was built in the cathedral to honor the 10th century King Wenceslas. Murals on its walls depict the king's life and sudden death. To this day, the Christmas carol, Good King Wenceslas, celebrates the king of what was then called Bohemia. Wenceslas embraced a new religion which was spreading across Eastern Europe, Christianity. The arrival of Christianity tore families apart in the kingdom. Many still worshipped pagan idols. The royal family was no different. Wenceslas's pagan mother killed his grandmother because she became a Christian. And he had a younger brother, Boleslav, who kept the pagan faith. When Wenceslas inherited the kingdom, Boleslav's resentment of his Christian brother festered. Wenceslas was so devoted to the new religion, he took a vow of chastity, guaranteeing he would never have an heir. When Boleslav had a son who would succeed when Wenceslas died, the royal line was destined to pass to the younger brother. Still, he remained jealous of the pious Wenceslas. Suddenly, in the autumn of 929, Boleslav declared he was converting to Christianity. He built a church and invited King Wenceslas to attend its dedication. The king was overjoyed at his brother's turn of conscience. He left the capital Prague to travel to the new church at his brother's stronghold, Stara Boleslav. The younger brother gave Wenceslas a warm Christian greeting when he arrived. But that evening, a feast honoring the king's visit and Boleslav's conversion took on an ominous air. As the wine flowed, Boleslav's intoxicated knights forgot their reputed Christian piety. The drunken knights grew boisterous and then turned abusive as they insulted Wenceslas. His brother Boleslav did little to restrain them. Tension grew as the knights stood with unsheathed swords but King Wenceslas's guards challenged them. Boleslav finally called his men to order, averting a deadly showdown in public.
When Wenceslas got up to go to bed, the drunken knights crowded around, menacing him. The king mustered all his royal authority to force his way out. Boleslav pointedly failed to help his brother to the door. Boleslav's new church was to be consecrated the next day. The devout King Wenceslas rose early to pray, then set out to the church. He was alone. When Wenceslas got to the chapel door, it slammed shut and the bolts were drawn. Wenceslas grasped the door handle, seeking sanctuary in the holy place, as Boleslav's men surrounded him. The men grabbed the king, dragging him to his younger brother's feet. Boleslav raised his sword and declared, Yesterday I served thee as I could. Today, behold how brother serves brother. Boleslav had invited his brother to his own funeral. Sibling rivalry and blind ambition, made even more venomous by religious conflict, had driven Boleslav to spill his own family's blood. With Wenceslas dead, Boleslav seized power and vowed to rid his country of the new Christian religion. But the king's murder brought on a strange series of events. When the horse-drawn hearse bearing Wenceslas's body entered Prague, the horses suddenly stopped in front of the main prison. The driver whipped them on, but they wouldn't budge. The horses held their ground until jailers released men unjustly imprisoned by Boleslav. Only then would the horses move on. Other miracles followed. It was said that the lame walked, the blind could see. When the Pope heard of Wenceslas's martyrdom, the murdered king was declared a saint. The church then put pressure on Boleslav to show respect. He was forced to dig up his brother's body and move it to a new cathedral in the center of Prague. Saint Wenceslas's reputation spread across Europe. This sword and this helmet, relics of the king's last hours, have become national treasures. Boleslav's ambition to grab a place in history failed as Bohemia became a Christian nation and Wenceslas became its patron saint. And every Christmas, children sing carols about good King Wenceslas, not about his murderous brother. Royal assassination came not only to the saintly, the evil sometimes had their just deserts. Witness the saga of England's Edward II. This unpopular royal ruled in the 1300s, his tyrannical reign blooded by gruesome executions. Official word claimed he died in his sleep. So in the last hours of his life, what were the awful screams coming from his window? Edward flouted the rules of monarchy. He ignored senior advisers, insulted barons and nobles, confiscated their lands, and squandered the treasury on the whims of his favorites. 
Some of these young men were rumored to be his lovers. Edward was forced to make a diplomatic marriage to French Princess Isabella, but he soon neglected her and returned to his male lovers. Alienating both the nobles and his wife, King Edward had made a powerful set of enemies. The queen took a lover, Lord Roger Mortimer. To be rid of Isabella, the king sent her to France as his ambassador. With the queen gone, Edward accused her lover, Mortimer, of treason and condemned him to death in the Tower of London. The night before his execution, Mortimer invited his guards to take a last glass of wine with him. The wine was drugged, and Mortimer escaped to France to join the Queen. There, Isabella and Mortimer gathered an army of disaffected English nobles and returned to England to depose the King. A monk named Thomas Dunhead, a friend of King Edward's, later wrote about the events he witnessed. In the year of 1327, there came many knights against our Lord Edward, and foremost amongst them was his own queen. She came with her lover, Roger Mortimer, and against the will of the king, fermented rebellion against him. Arriving in London, Queen Isabella encouraged her subjects to rise up against Edward. Sick of their corrupt king, Londoners responded to the queen's words. A frenzied mob soon ran riot in the streets. The swarm dragged one of Edward's cronies, the Bishop of London, from his horse and cut his head off with a butcher's knife. The howling mob then turned to hunt down Edward's favorite boys. They were captured, sexually mutilated and executed. Edward realized all was lost and fled towards Wales, hoping to catch a ship to Ireland. But the Queen's men overtook him before he reached the coast. King Edward II was brought to Kenilworth Castle to face the fury of his barons. Then there came to Kenilworth the bishops, earls and barons, and they recited to our Lord the King his shortcomings. He quite freely admitted that he had governed badly, and with tears and on his knees he cried for mercy for this and asked them to pardon him. As the king bowed his head, the lord of Edward's court broke the royal staff of office, declaring the king's household dissolved. He threw the pieces at the groveling king. Edward's abdication meant Queen Isabella could put their young son on the throne. Since he was only a boy, Isabella and her lover Mortimer effectively controlled England. The disgraced king was locked up here at Berkeley Castle while Isabella and Mortimer pondered Edward's fate. One night, Edward's friend, the monk Thomas Dunhead, slipped into the castle. Under the guards' noses, Edward and Dunhead escaped. Afraid that King Edward would lead a revolt against them, Isabella and Mortimer ordered a frantic search. Within a few days, Edward was recaptured and thrown back into the dungeon at Berkeley Castle. A hideous fate awaited him. Isabella knew her position would never be safe while Edward lived. Mortimer sent a letter to Edward's jailers at Berkeley. Get rid of the king but do it discreetly. The outright murder of a king anointed by God could easily provoke a rebellion against the perpetrators. There must be no sign of foul play.
While Edward was kept in his cell, a pit next to it was filled with rotting animal corpses. Though the king lay for days gasping in the putrid air, the toxic fumes failed to suffocate him. Another method had to be found. The solution the assassins reached was ingenious and horrific. The monk Dunhead described the terrible events. They came rushing in on him suddenly as he lay in his bed. They thrust a red hot plumber's iron up into his bowels through a funnel put in at the fundament. Burning thereby his inward parts. The king's death was excruciating. Even though the killers had taken care to make the murder as quiet as possible, several people on the other side of the castle walls heard screams that night, but they were too afraid to speak out. The official announcement said King Edward died suddenly. As he lay in state, no visible marks of violence were seen on his body. Edward was buried in Gloucester Cathedral, and a veil was drawn over the events. Rumours flew, but afraid of sharing the king's fate, no one dared to claim he had been murdered. Even the monk Thomas Dunhead refused to accuse Isabella and Mortimer, his new rulers. With regard to the king's decease, I prefer to say no more about the matter, for sometimes lies are for the advantage of the many, and to tell the whole truth does harm. Edward II's assassination was a secret killing, but Henry IV of France repeatedly faced public attempts on his life. Ruling at a time of religious strife, Henry survived 19 assassination attempts by the time he was 53. The king had already been almost strangled, and a stabbing had left his face permanently scarred. After yet another assassination attempt, this time with poison, Henry had all his food tasted. When his personal cook was away, the king of France dined only on boiled eggs. Religious conflict raged between Catholics and Protestants in 16th century France. Henry was a Protestant leader. His first marriage was to the reigning king's sister, who was a Catholic. When Henry's Protestant friends gathered to celebrate the marriage, Catholics attacked them. 3,000 were slaughtered in the infamous St. Bartholomew's Eve massacre. Later, when Henry rose to become king, he converted to Catholicism in an attempt to peacefully unite France. Known as Henry the Great, he was a successful ruler, but fanatic Catholics were still out to get him. With a long string of mistresses, his love life became public knowledge and left his first marriage in tatters. Henry IV's sexual appetite and Protestant background enraged Catholic zealots like Francois Ravaillac, an unemployed schoolteacher. Still believing the king was a heretic, Ravaillac refused to accept Henry's conversion to Catholicism. Prone to hallucinations, Ravaillac felt a divine calling to kill the king. At the beginning of May 1610, Ravaillac came to Paris and stole a large kitchen knife from an inn. For days, he stalked Henry, but he couldn't get past the king's guards. By Friday, May the 14th, the deranged Ravaillac was about to give up his mission when fate intervened. On the same day,
King Henry was preparing to greet his second wife, who had been crowned in Reims Cathedral and was to make a ceremonial entrance into Paris. A day of festivities was planned. That afternoon, the king set out to inspect preparations for her arrival. It was a warm, sunny day as Henry rode in an open carriage. He left the Louvre Palace and moved along the Rue Saint-Honoré before turning into the Rue de la Ferronnerie. By coincidence, Ravayek was walking down the same street at the same time. As the king's carriage passed, Ravayek realized a God-given opportunity had come his way. Henry and his companion were completely unaware of any danger to the king. After surviving 19 attempts on his life, Henry's luck was finally running out. By sheer chance, the street ahead was blocked by a hay wagon. The royal carriage came to a stop. The king's security guards rode ahead to clear the way, leaving Henry unguarded. Ravayek seized the moment. He plunged the knife into Henry's chest, just above his heart. Henry IV died instantly, but his death was concealed from the public for fear of riots. After so many attempts on Henry's life, an assassin had finally succeeded. Ravayek was taken for questioning to the conciergerie the infamous torture chamber of Paris. Royal security guards were convinced Ravayek was a pawn in a conspiracy to overthrow the crown and impose a strict Catholic state on France. He was tortured to name his accomplices. His foot was crushed in a vice known as the boot. The arm that wielded the knife was plunged into burning sulfur. His flesh was first torn off with red-hot pincers. Then he was drenched with molten lead and boiling oil. The torture lasted two weeks, but throughout his ordeal, Ravayek swore he acted alone. His torturers finally accepted he was telling the truth. On the 27th of May, 1610, Ravayek was taken to Notre Dame Cathedral to atone for his crime. Then he was led here to the Place de Greve, the public execution square. A huge, furious crowd was waiting. The assassins' arms and legs were roped between four strong horses. They pulled in opposite directions. Ravayek's body was stretched for an hour and a half before it ripped apart. Finally, the crowd hacked what was left of Ravayek into tiny pieces. Edward II, Henry IV, King Wenceslas were examples to other monarchs. Saintly, good or evil, royals always faced the threat of murderous plots launched by their foes, or even by their own families. The assassin's message was clear. A king can never trust anyone.